Good afternoon, everybody. If you are here today, probably you know what Zephyr is. Probably you have heard of it in this conference or in other conferences. For the ones who don't, it is an open source project aimed at simplifying the development of new lightweight IoT solutions. My name is Vincenzo Frascino, and I am here today uh, to present to you the results of the porting of Zephyr OS on ARM Beetle, and more in general, to provide hints and tips for porting the OS to new platforms. This presentation is not meant to be a fully comprehensive uh, porting guide, but a starting point for those of you who are interested in porting or in, a, in a new platform this operating system. But let's begin. In today's presentation, uh, we will go uh, through a brief overview. We will analyze Zephyr's architecture. We will focus on the porting of uh, Zephyr on Beetle, starting from the basic concepts up to the device model and the drivers. And hoping that at that point, I have inspired you a bit, we will see how to contribute to the project. And at the end, we will have a little demo and some examples running on Beetle. What is Zephyr? As we have seen this morning from Anna's presentation, basically Zephyr is uh, an operating system that runs on microcontroller units with a small, small footprint. Its code base was established in 2000, uh, more than 15 years ago, and it has been made open source in February 2016, almost a year ago. It is licensed under Apache 2.0, it is modular and configurable. It uses, in particular, kconfig and kbuild, and now even the device tree to uh, allow uh, versatility and configuration. It does not provide a user space and a dynamic runtime. It means that basically all the system is described at compile time. It allocates memory and resources when possible statically. And it is obviously cross-platform, as we have heard. It runs actually on R, on x86, on Arc, and uh, on many other platforms, right? Risk V or other systems. But how Zephyr does that? Basically, uh, Zephyr uh, OS can be divided in a BSP, a set of kernel components, an high-level API, and an application. This is basically a generic image that runs on your hardware, like it does on Beetle, for example. The Zephyr kernel offers a single address space. Basically, the application and your kernel is compiled into a single image. It's highly configurable, as we have seen with kbuild and kconfig. It, uh, as a compile time resource definition, so you describe all your system at compile time. When the image comes out, it contains all the information already defined. It has a minimal error checking to uh, allow high performances. And uh, basically, if you are in debugging mode, you can enable extra error checking. And uh, it provides a suite of services. This suite of services is, are, uh, for example, multi-thread IRQ management and, and others. Today, in this presentation, we will focus on this part, in particular on board support, on the SOC support, on device drivers, and a little bit on power management. Even if it requires, what did it happen? Let's hope that this time it works. <laughs> okay, but uh, how Zephyr does that? As we were, uh, as we were seeing, it has a, a set of uh, facilities in order to uh, enable these operations, and uh, basically, uh, in, in today's presentation, uh, we will focus uh, on the BSPs, on the BSP, and on the kernel parts that have direct impact on it, that, and in particular on the board support, on the SOC support, on the device driver part, and on a little bit on the power management. How can we take advantage of all of these? Uh, let's uh, start from some basics like the setup of the environment. Uh, before setting up the environment, of course, we need to know what uh, is uh, our board and what we are compiling for. So basically, in uh, our case, uh, we are using this device here that is a Beetle board. A Beetle board is uh, Cortex-M3 based, and uh, it's uh, an ARMS IoT evaluation platform that includes the IoT subsystem 
uh, for Cortex-M and uh, the Cordio uh, BLE Smart Radio. It has uh, 256 kilobytes of flash, 128 kilobytes of RAM, and has an external flash of two megabytes. Offers some debug interfaces, and uh, it is uh, compliant with the Arduino shields. Let's see uh, how to compile for this platform a single application uh, like it can be Hello World. So uh, this example is uh, tested on Ubuntu 14.4 uh, and to set up your uh, development environment, basically what you need to do is uh, 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 install the SDK provided by the Zephyr uh, uh, project and uh, a set of other utilities that you can use uh, together with uh, your uh, uh, Ubuntu pre-installed and uh, then clone the, the source code and uh, provide to the Zephyr uh, OS uh, compilation system uh, environment variables that uh, provide uh, to the compilation system the information in order to compile. Zephyr uh, uh, supports even external SDKs and uh, in uh, particular, as you can see from, from here, uh, I provide another example with the uh, GCC ARM. Uh, the only difference is that basically you, you install it from an external repository and uh, uh, when you set up your environment variables, uh, you define G GCC ARM as the main compiler that you want to use. Now that we have set up our environment, uh, we will use it to compile a single application and to verify that this is uh, working. The simplest application that we can compile and that is provided together with the Zephyr project is the Hello World application. The Hello World application basically can be compiled using this set of commands. It, it uh, resides in samples Hello World and after you have set up the environment with the Zephyr-M.sh script, you can compile it for a specific platform using the switch board equal. In our case, board equal is V2M Beetle, that is the name of the board that we are using. Once we have finished, we flash the binary and we can have an output like this one. Obviously, this is the final result of a basic porting because a basic porting is a, a set of features plus a serial port and the rest we can figure it out going basically once we have the serial port. But let's see uh, what we have to do to get there. And in particular, let's see how do we port a BSP to Zephyr. To port a BSP to Zephyr, basically what we need to focus on is the SOC porting that uh, resides in ARC, ARC that can be ARM, AI32 or x86, SOC. And inside there, we, uh, we will have a directory called, uh, like the name of our SOC, in which we put all the files that we need to do the supporting. Same thing we will do for the board. In particular, with the board, we will provide the devconfig file, and the devconfig file will have the name board underscore devconfig, like in Linux, this. So after we did that, we will start implementing a set of drivers that are required by our platform, like can be pin maxing, GPIO, each one residing on different directories into drivers. And uh, uh, once we finish it, we will have to provide a set of documentation in order to cover uh, the basic information that we are putting into our implementation. Let's see how this works all together, and in particular, Let's see how on ARM platform Zephyr does the boot and on which moment of the boot our drivers are called in order to understand how to plug our drivers in the big system. So basically, at the reset handler, what happens is that Zephyr sets up an initial stack, verifies if we are running, running an executing place uh, system, and uh, this uh, uh, is true for almost all the ARM platform that I saw. And if uh, this is true, it copies the initialized data from ROM to RAM. Once this is done, locks the interrupt that will be unlocked once the main task goes in execution. Uh, if present, initializes the platform watchdog. And uh, uh, once this is done, uh, switches the stack from the main stack pointer to the program stack pointer. 
once this operation is complete, it jumps to the PREP-C. PREP-C is uh, an, an architecture-specific uh, feature that uh, allows uh, to set up a basic system to run C code. So to do that, basically what PREP-C does, it uh, uh, relocates the vector table if uh, the option is enabled. It enables the FPU, again, if the option is enabled. It zeros the BSS section. And once this is finished, it jumps to the uh, main is initialization to the kernel that is done through the C, uh, start uh, functionality that resides in kernel init.c. The responsibility of uh, uh, C start is uh, uh, to context switch from a fake context that is the one that on which we are running at reset in a uh, startup context uh, or, or better said, the main thread. Now, uh, now, at this point, once this is done, we are able to execute C code. In particular, the uh, perspective on which C start does this is uh, initializing the kernel data structures and uh, the interrupt subsystem, and it performs the initial uh, driver initialization. In particular, you can see here three levels, uh, kernel one, kernel two, and primary. Uh, kernel 1 and kernel 2 are the one introduced by the new unified kernel. The primary is heritage from the past and it's actually going to be deprecated with 1.8. Once this is done, basically, uh, let me spend another couple of words on these uh, initialization uh, features. Basically, when we pr plug our drivers, uh, we need to plug the basic system here. For example, if we want to do pin maxing, the initial pin maxing of the board, probably it will be a kernel one. Once this is done, uh, basically it, it initializes the canaries and uh, uh, if configured, it prints the banner of the operating system. Finished with this, basically it goes to the real initialization of the multitasking. So, uh, so in particular, initialize the main thread. On ARM platforms, uh, the main thread is implemented via this function here, and in particular what it does, it uh, moves the program stack pointer to the higher address in the stack, unlocks the interrupts, and uh, branches to the underscore main functionality that uh, is the functionality that at the end we'll call the main of our application. Underscore main basically does the second part of the initialization of the kernel. So basically, if we have a high level uh, uh, feature in our operating system, we can initialize it here. Or if uh, uh, we have a functionality that takes advantage of what we have initialized in the kernel one, kernel two initialization, we will initialize it here. In particular, uh, as you can notice, uh, even for the second part, here there are some features that are deprecated because they are initialization uh, features of the nano kernel and micro kernel that are uh, been uh, rewritten into the unified kernel. That is the variant that we are using now into Zephyr. Once this initialization is complete, uh, basically the underscore main initializes the static threads like the idle, for example, and uh, jumps to the main. The main is the main of our application, and at that point, basically, the, the firmware does what we have decided for it to do. Said that, uh, basically, uh, let's see how the SOC porting plugs in this infrastructure. In order to have a complete SOC porting, uh, SOC porting we need uh, four uh, kconfig files. In particular, one that defines the SOC, one that defines the series on which we are working, one that defines the def config of the series, and one that defines the def config of the variant. So the variant is the specific uh, chip of the series that we are using. For example, the series is Beetle, Beetle R0, that has specific features like a dimension of the RAM, a dimension of the ROM, is our variant. Uh, Kconfig series, what does in particular, it uh, enables the family and the uh, specification of the SOC to which uh, we have to rely in order to boot our system. Done that, uh, basically, we have to start adding a set of uh, uh, source files. 
and in particular, the boot entry code of our platform that is defined in SOC.C, the uh, IRQs definition that is defined in uh, SOC underscore IRQs.h, the pin definitions that is defined in pins.h, and SOC underscore pins.h, the registers uh, that are defined in SOC underscore registers, and the power management that is defined in power management.c. Some of these include probably will go away when uh, the device tree will be there completely. Uh, if we look at this implementation of the SOC.c file, basically what we do at the beginning of, uh, our, of the life of our SOC is uh, lock the ARQs, initialize the power management. Basically, uh, in, uh, um, in the AMP platform, uh, we have uh, three uh, states, uh, uh, three states in the state machine of the power management that are active, sleep, and deep sleep. In each of them, we need to initialize a set of clocks and we need to initialize as well the wake-up sources that are allowed to wake up our system when we go to sleep. All these operations are done in the soft power unit. And if you go to the bit of code and develop to the functionality, you can easily identify uh, what I'm talking about right now. Once you have done that, we initialize the non-masquerable uh, interrupt. And uh, once this is done, basically, uh, we unlock the interrupt and the execution will continue. Obviously, for what we have said in uh, the uh, initial configuration of uh, our bootstrap of the kernel on ARM architectures, this is executed in kernel one. How can we identify that? Basically, device.h provides a set of macros that allow uh, the, uh, the kernel of compile type to identify in, uh, uh, what it has to do in order to uh, statically allocate the resources. Two of these macros that are very important are CCinit, like this one, and it's used uh, mainly when basically you have a simple init function and don't have to register APIs for that particular function. And uh, in this case, you can identify that it's a pre-kernel one, so it's plugged into the execution at pre-kernel one, and basically it calls the, this init function that I am defining here. Once this is executed, basically our basic SOC, it is initialized. Let's see now, uh, how do we plug the board? The board is uh, responsible mainly for uh, the definitions that are related to the board, the uh, initial pin maxing, it's responsible for the configuration files that are board related. For example, if you have some sensors that have specific configuration on the board, you put the configuration at this level. It's uh, uh, responsible for the main platform make file, that is the one that defines all the uh, uh, make uh, configurations that you need in order to compile your board and uh, of the board documentation. So basically the documentation is very important and uh, uh, it, it has to provide at least uh, one example of application with which you have tested your board once you deliver it for acceptance into the Zephyr kernel. Another thing that is very important at this level we define our dev config. And uh, once you are ready to submit your patch, a third action that you have to take in order to have it accepted is add your board to the sanity check. This is very important because sanity check is an automated test environment that is inside Zephyr that uh, allows you to have static uh, uh, test uh, at build time and uh, uh, let's say dynamic at runtime. You can set different options. Let's see now how we define our dev config and how this uh, will take uh, action on our key config file. So basically in our dev config, we define all the principal features of uh, the ARM architecture and how it has to be uh, invoked and defined and which are the features in the kernel that it has to enable. And uh, we define a set of IPs that needs to be initialized. So for example, in the case of Beetle, we define here the config GPIO and uh, once this takes effect in the dev config for the generation of the final configuration file, the dot config, basically it enables all the ports that are defined into the digital architecture. Now that we have defined the socket dev board, our attention goes to the drivers. And in particular, Zephyr OS supports different types of drivers 
It provides a consistent device model that is responsible for the configuration of the drivers that are part of the system and for initializing them at, uh, when the drivers are configured. Each type of driver is supported by a generic API, and this API is defined in device.h. And uh, basically, this API is done in a way that is independent from the system. Let's see in particular what this independence means. And to do that, we have to reference the device model. In particular, what this does mean is basically that your application will get the binding of the IP that is using, and this binding will provide a generic API. In order to be sure that you are providing this generic API, the initialization function that you have to call is device and API init. And we will see an example in the GPIOs later. Once this is done, basically, your API is exposed to the application that can access to it like uh, function pointers. This uh, uh, generic API is done in a way that basically uh, allows uh, the system to be independent from the driver implementation, and in particular defines a set of actions that are implemented as a function pointer by your drivers. Obviously, uh, if you have, uh, uh, when you are writing your code, you are just adding a B driver to the system. So let's say that the A driver is already there, you are adding a B driver, but obviously, when you are trying to access to the device, the scenario is like this. So basically, you are trying to access only to an hardware of which you are getting the binding. Let's see now how this uh, device model reflects on the drivers. And in particular, let's start from the pin maxing because it's the easier one. What the pin maxing defines is the pin maxing at boot time. So uh, we have two types of pin maxing. We have static pin maxing, that is this one, and the runtime pin maxing that uh, is uh, a different driver that we will see later. The static pin maxing is defined inside pin maxing.c and uh, basically uh, it uh, rotates uh, the pin, uh, it maxes the pin that are uh, allocated for specific functionality. For example, if you have a loop there, I have a UART port that needs to be enabled and in order to, access, uh, to let the AP access to its own pins, I have to rotate it. Even in this case, uh, this uh, uh, is executed through an init function, so I am reusing the CC And uh, for obvious reason, this is executed again in kernel one. The runtime pin maxing uh, allows, uh, instead, to have the opportunity to rotate the pins from your application. This is uh, mainly a prototyping feature in uh, Zephyr, because when it is possible, things are done statically. So uh, suggestion is uh, in order to not break shields that you plug on your system to check the TRM. And uh, more than the, well, I shouldn't say this, but uh, it's uh, something that uh, I, I like to, to suggest and to encourage people to do before they, they use uh, the dynamic pin maxing. And uh, basically, uh, it is uh, mainly used uh, for uh, early testing and prototyping. It, um, it can be used even for power management if you want to do particular operations. In this case, it provides an API, and as we can see, basically, it is using the uh, device and API in it. So how does it work? Uh, based on what we were saying uh, with relation to the device model, uh, it provides a set of generic functions that are called by your application, like set, get, pull up, and input. These are filled to function pointers uh, implemented in this file and are passed to the device and the API in it uh, through uh, a pointer to the struct. Uh, yes. And basically, once this is done, it's not much visible for me, I guess. Can you see it, guys? Okay. It's, uh, it's passed here as a pointer. And basically, when your program gets the binding, you can access to this functionality. Okay. There are some uh, IP, uh, some uh, IPs in certain SOCs that manage both GPIOs and pin maxing in a single IP. But there are others that basically are split. They split the functionality. So that's the reason why in Zephyr you find a driver that is responsible for the GPIOs and a driver that is responsible for the pin maxing. Even if on Beetle, uh, this differentiation could be avoided because we have a single IP that manages both the functionalities. Anyway, 
following the implementation that is uh, provided by Zephyr OS, uh, the API for the GPIOs is provided by GPIO.h, and it offers the standard functionalities to access to the some GPIOs, like the configuration, the read, the write, and uh, the callback for the RQ when the RQ is raised. So this is the way on which uh, the GPIO is initialized in code. So uh, what we do here is uh, we provide a static structure that uh, is, uh, uh, is initialized only if your GPIO 0 port is configured in your test config. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it uses the same logic of the device and the PI in it that we saw for the thing maxing. Done that, basically, you will be able to access uh, to your GPIO's implementation. Same logic and philosophy follows the UART, but the UART, uh, the difference is that can be uh, accessed both in interrupt mode and in polling. So to do that, as you can see from the feature set, provides uh, a couple of different options of configuration. You have the default that is the polling, you have poll in and poll out, and uh, you have all the features that you need to implement in order to have access interrupt driven. The API is provided by UART.h, and the UART is initialized in kernel 1 because, obviously, for debugging, the most common way is using the print, the print k. So basically, you want to have access to it. Let's see the watchdog. The watchdog on Beetle, I use this example because it's a bit particular. So shares the interrupt with the non-maskerable interrupt. So basically, what you need to do to enable the interrupt on a platform that is in, uh, configured in this way, you need to configure something called runtime NMI. So runtime NMI allows you to replace the interrupt into uh, your uh, into uh, the interrupt associated to your IRQ number with the new one that you are going to define when you initialize your driver. And in particular, the functionality that allows you to do that is uh, the NMI handler set. So done that, basically, next time the interrupt uh, handler is, uh, the interrupt, uh, the NMI interrupt is catched, uh, the, instead of calling the initial uh, routine that you set up when we defined the SOC, we are calling our routine. Obviously, doing that, we are uh, going to uh, take care of managing a real NMI happening. So basically, if it's, uh, we have to discriminate if it is coming from the watchdog or it's a real NMI. So done that, let's see now how uh, we uh, build a driver into our Zephyr system. We saw few classes of drivers. Now we see how this can be built. In particular, the strategy that uh, I like to follow when I do these things, and maybe it can be useful for some one of you, is uh, uh, before configure the driver where it sits, so in the directory where it sits, and after configure the platform to use the driver. In particular, uh, what, what I do is modifying the make file that uh, handles uh, the, the driver itself, modifying the kconfig that is local to the driver in order to enable the features and the functionalities, and then enabling the uh, def config of the platform and uh, the, uh, um, the, def the kconfig of the platform and the def config of the platform, as you can see here, basically. Once this is done, basically, uh, you can use one of the examples to compile this particular IP and compile it into your uh, uh, into your application and use it with the API get device binding and providing an A. Basically, uh, this is mostly all what you need to do in order to port a new platform into Zephyr, a basic platform. Obviously, as I said at the beginning, this is a starting point, so there are more things that you, you, you need to do if you want to enhance it and provide new functionalities, like, for example, the clock control or and other functionalities can be the timer, so, and so far and so on. In fact, uh, to complete uh, the porting of Beetle, we need to take some extra steps. So let's see what are these extra steps. What we will need to do is basically to uh, improve, continue, to, uh, continue improving the code base to remain aligned with the, with the new development of Zephyr, enable the missing IPs, uh, the missing IP drivers, and uh, uh, complete the power management. Uh, our implementation still doesn't support deep sleep. 
enable the connectivity, our chip, as I said, does be a little power, and uh, we are planning to enable it in the coming months, and uh, enhance the documentation. That is something that uh, it's very important for this project. Sorry if I stress a lot on this. Now, I hope, apart the accident that we had with my laptop switching that I have inspired you a bit, so let's see how to contribute to the project because it's very good to have new hands and new people that uh, look at our code and provide new idea because an op the, the powerfulness of an open source project is getting in new ideas and get inspiration from new people that just start working on the project and provide their view on things. To contribute to this project, basically, uh, what you need to do is uh, pretty easy, are five, six steps. You need to request an account to the Linux Foundation. Probably if you are here, you already have one because you had to subscribe to come here. So this step, we can cancel it. You have to clone the Zephyr source code and start hacking. That is the funniest part. Create a patch uh, on, from the source, uh, li latest source tree. Check the code style and uh, some other things and uh, uh, submit the changes through the Garrett. Once this is done, uh, the review will start and uh, hoping that everything is done well, you will get your code in and uh, you can continue the development. To make something useful, uh, I want to provide to you the links to which you can do this operation. So basically, the Garrett repository is the first one and uh, basically this is the way to clone it via Git. You can find a lot of information on the Zephyr project website. But if you are not satisfied, you want more, you want to know details of something, there are two very useful mailing lists to which you can subscribe and uh, become part of the community. And these are in particular the development mailing list and the user's mailing list. Development mailing list is more used for problems uh, like that you can encounter during the development and you want to submit to the rest of the community. And the user's mailing list is mostly used if you are trying to use the kernel, so making an application and other stuff. And then we have an IRC channel uh, that uh, is for the project and one for the BLE related topics that are these two that I pointed out there. Now, let's go to the demo. It was already, but I had to reset my laptop, obviously. So basically, this is a beetle. And uh, let's say that you are trying to debug a new shield, OK? So you just created, soldered your shield because you are trying to prototype something. And you want to know if all the things that you put on your shield are behaving correctly. Now, Awake and B write a lot of C li lines of code in C and uh, discover later if this is true or use another open source project that is called MicroPython and write simple scripts to do the same thing. What I want to show to you today is basically how I can leverage MicroPython, putting it on my Zephyr implementation using the GPIOs in order to verify if my LED and my two sensors here are working. 
And to do that, I will use simple scripts. But let's start. Let me do this a bit bigger. Please tell me you can see it. Okay. So, basically, uh, let's start with the LED. Let's say that let's say that you solder the LED, and you want to verify that the LED is working. Once your uh, uh, obviously a LED is connected through a GP, uh, to a GPIO through a resistor, and uh, uh, let's uh, let's see how this can be blinked in order to verify that it's working. I'm going to copy and paste a script that we will comment together in a second. Huh? Yes. Okay. So, basically, this is the basic script to link a LED. I am selecting which GPIO of the LED is connected. I am uh, doing a while through and then putting the LED to one and to zero. So, this is all what you need to do. And the first time I, I wrote it, I was surprised it was working. <laughs> Seriously, because you have to write at least uh, three times C code in order to have similar functionalities, considering make files, project files, and everything to put it into, into Zephyr. So, can you see the LED blinking? Okay. So now, let's complicate it a bit. Let's say that you are in a scenario in which you want to debug one of the sensors that are here, and in particular this one. That is, uh, forgot what is this, is a sonar. So uh, basically, this is uh, sonar access, you can access to it through the wired protocol. So basically you define a time slice and it keeps sending to you one and zero based on the value that you want to send and there is a, uh, conversion formula on the uh, technical reference manual of the sensor. So in order to, uh, in order to basically access to it, uh, this is the Python code that I need to write. Now I'll show it to you. Okay. It's all here, again. So basically, I am expecting zero and one from the sensor. I am accessing to the GPIO, and I am verifying that zero and one is coming back. It's working. So now, let's complicate it a bit more. Let's say that for the third sensor, I want to write a driver. It's again using the wired protocol, but in this case, I want to write a full full driver. So the third sensor is a uh, max uh, 9814, and uh, basically is this guy here. So it measures the level of noise. Let's stop this. This is all what I need to do to read the noise level in the room. So, considering that you are very quiet, it should be low. Yeah. 
depth is very low. If we want to verify that it's, it's working, I can keep blipping on the sensor, executing the same code, and uh, verify that the value goes high. Yep. So basically, now we can go back to the presentation. If I find the mouse. What we have seen here. We have seen basically uh, MicroPython, and you can compile MicroPython if you are interested on your platform using uh, the, uh, the easiest way is using a linear release, but you can rely on the MicroPython official repository in order to compile it. This, uh, this example is based on the linear release, that's why I put it on these slides. The source code can be accessed there. What you need to do is a set of simple operations in order to get it. Again, you are compiling for the Beetle board. And uh, what we have seen right now is uh, basically something similar to this to verify that it was working. Said that, uh, I, will, I leave you with one example that I run here if you want to try it at home on a new board. In conclusion, so we have seen uh, Zephyr architecture today. We have seen the setup of the environment. We have seen basic porting of Zephyr on Beetle. We've seen how to contribute to the project, and we have seen MicroPython. But before concluding, uh, let me say that uh, I joined the Zephyr project less, uh, less than six months ago, and this for me is a tremendous moment of being there. I was too young in the early 90s, so we are hosted by the ELC here, and uh, I was too young uh, to leave the early days of Linux, but uh, reading from the books and the mailing list of that age, Basically, uh, I feel the similar sensation that uh, my code can really change something in the project, in this historical moment of the project. So again, please come and join us. Thank you for coming. So if you have any questions, these are my contacts. If you want to refer to them, take a picture. I don't know. Yes, please. Uh, it provides a console. You have a console shell that you can compile inside your application. Uh, it's uh, already it's, it has already some commands for debugging purposes, but you can extend it if you are interested in. Uh, I started six months ago the porting. And uh, basically, I am already at this stage. I did even some work with Andy uh, for the device tree, as you have seen from his presentation this morning. So basically, it takes, uh, let's say, a month to port the basic platform and to ramp up. And then uh, the easiest way, the, the easiest thing that I found in the project is literally access to the channel and ask to people. So it's, it's the easiest. Or just send an email or... Uh, you have my reference on IRC. You can ask to me directly, and if I don't know, I can point you to the right people that can provide to you the information that you want. Can we do like electron or node web application? Uh, I am not sure uh, uh, what you mean with WebKit because WebKit is an engine for uh, web browsing, right? So, uh, yeah, so it's no, I guess. yeah. Because uh, this, is, uh, this is a system that uh, runs on uh, as less as eight kilobytes. So basically, if you want to implement WebKit, you would need megabytes, I guess. I am not expert of the technology, but I guess you need megabytes. Sorry. Uh, uh, Micro, micro, with MicroPython is a bit bigger, it's like 100, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's because uh, it implements a lot of things. So uh, I can compile the same example with LED blinking in uh, 9 to 10 kilobytes. I, I am here three days, I, I mean I can show it to you if you want. Uh, 
Uh, I have the image here. We can check how big it is. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I can provide to you the precise number. It's 127 case. Yeah, no problem. In an earlier presentation, we heard some of their pain points for contributing to the WRP. Yeah. I'd love to hear some of your pain points. Okay, uh, basically, uh, most of the pain points uh, were because of, uh, of the way on which I approached the project. So, I give you an example. If you go into the project and you push 10 patches, 15 patches in one go, uh, for how Garrett is organized, the chance that you get to have people looking at all 15 the patches, it's not big, okay? So you, something m goes missing, something remains left out and maybe it's crucial for you to get the change in, especially if you are pushing a new platform. Is what I did at the beginning with Beetle. This is my experience. Then I learned and basically now I push maximum three, four patches based on functionality, and uh, I use topic branches. That is something very useful inside the project. When you send to Garrett for review, uh, basically uh, when you do refs for uh, some branch, then you can add another slash and add a topic. For example, V2M Beetle in my case, or a particular feature on Beetle. This helps the maintainers or who us to review the patches to understand what you are going to target and uh, makes easier for them to review the code. Any other question? Okay, can you rise because I have this, the fun Sorry. here. You mentioned that so for like the device drivers the GPIO there's a set of functions that yeah. uh, there's a set of functions that are being implemented for whatever backend you have for your yeah. board. Is it, do they have support for other drivers than just GPIO or is it, or is that all you've explored yeah, for now? Basically, and you are what I was uh, explaining during the presentation is that there is a full device model divided in classes. So basically each uh, class of drivers that is supported like the serial, like uh, the pin max, like it can be timers, clock control, everyone has his device model and uh, basically you can rely on the device model file, uh, either file, as part of the documentation in order to implement what you need to implement. Okay, uh, next question. We have still eight minutes if you want. <laughs> I'm here. Okay, I think we are done. Thanks again for coming and See you in the next day, in the next few days.